gentlemen. Thank you, Kathleen, for that very kind introduction. Well, I'm delighted to be part of this special Hudson Union Gala, which is all about empowering girls and changing our world. It's also a very great pleasure and a real honor to have been invited to introduce to you a unique young woman and someone I've wanted to meet for a very long time. <coughs> Although she's still only 17 years old, Malala has already touched the lives of millions of people and has taken her place on the world stage as a hero for our times. Like many people outside of Pakistan, I first heard about Malala after Archbishop Desmond Tutu nominated her for the International Children's Peace Prize in 2011. But by the following year, the whole world knew her name. On October 9th, 2012, a Taliban gunman stopped the school bus she was on, demanded, who is Malala? And fired three shots from his Colt 45 at the only girl whose face was not covered by a veil. This small but significant act of freedom, not covering your face, declares, I am a person, I exist. This is me. And although no one had answered the gunman's question, Malala's lack of a veil was as good as a name tag. But in fact, the world had already heard much about Malala's life from her anonymous blog on the BBC Urdu website. And she was also known by her father's reputation. Ziauddin, who I can call Zia, was a vocal education reformer and activist who frequently spoke out against the Taliban's opposition to girls' education. Malala grew up in the Swat Valley, a beautiful region of northwest Pakistan, which I've had the privilege of visiting. It's a tourist destination, in fact, that is sometimes called the Switzerland of the East. As the Taliban's military hold on hold on SWAT intensified during Malala's young life, her fate might have been very different. She might have been like millions of other women across the world, living invisible lives, married off as a child bride, giving birth to maybe eight children, her life nothing but cooking and cleaning, entirely dependent in every way on her husband or male relatives. But luckily for Malala, her parents did not live that way. Her father has never been afraid to campaign for equality. He's spent years dedicated to teaching and to fighting for all children's rights to go to school. And he believed from the very beginning of Malala's life that she was special. And so this young girl was able to flourish. Her natural curiosity was encouraged and her quick brain devoured all the information given to her. And she learned, following her father's example, that she had a voice, she had a right to speak out, and she had a responsibility to try to make better life for those around her. One of Malala's first experiences of that urge to help others was when she saw a young girl scavenging on a local garbage tin. Seeing children her own age and younger spending their days collecting rubbish to sell instead of being able to go to school like she did was not something she could ignore. I know exactly how she felt, for in 2004 I visited Ecuador as a UN ambassador as part of their End Child Exploitation campaign. I was taken to a vast dump site where I met children as young as two years old, sifting through uh, the detritus of other people's lives, along with vultures and hospital waste. The stench was unbearable to me, even for one day, but those children lived their whole lives on the dump sites. They ate there, they slept there, and often they even died there. And that day I pledged to raise a million pounds to give those children some different choices. And in fact, I did raise a million, and with it, 
We built through UNICEF 70 schools through Ecuador and provided education and a hot meal for them every day, as well as a stipend for their parents so that the family suffered no loss of income. When Malala saw those desperately poor children working on her local garbage tip, she also knew that the way out of that poverty trap was through education. Luckily, she didn't need to start raising money for a school, as her father already had one, and she wasted no time to ask him to give the children free places there. That experience, I believe, taught Malala something very important about herself. She realized that she had a huge sense of responsibility towards others and wanted very much to dedicate her life to helping them. But I've got something else in common with Malala. After that merciless attack on her, she was taken to England to Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Birmingham, or very close by, is in fact where I was born and raised. And when I found out which school Malala was attending, I experienced a sudden thrill of recognition and awe. And that was a complete throwback to my school days at North Bromsgrove High School. As a regular member of the field hockey team, our most impressive rivals on the hockey pitch were in fact the gifted and brilliant girls from Malala School, the excellent Edgebuston High School for Girls. With this knowledge of where she goes to school, Malala became again a hero all over again in my eyes. Now, I don't know if you play field hockey, Malala. <laughs> But despite the opportunities life in England has to offer, Birmingham is a far cry from the Switzerland of the East. And I know she and her whole family miss their homeland very much, despite everything. What strikes me profoundly, having read Malala's own words in her book, is the tremendous well of love that she carries within her. Despite the public floggings, beheadings, and the bombings of schools by the Taliban in her hometown, she holds on to what she knows to be the real Islam because she loves her religion. Despite the political and military struggles making refugees of her family and neighbors within her own country, she still loves Pakistan. And despite the lack of humanity that she's seen and indeed suffered herself, she's still full of compassion. In March this year, I was in Vancouver for the TED conference where my husband Sting was speaking, and I was delighted to hear Malala's father speaking there too. And he said something very affecting, something which especially touched both Sting and me as parents. He said that when he's asked, why is my daughter so strong? He answers, because I didn't clip her wings. You know, the truth is, we can all make a difference to the world if we're given freedom, love, and support to become who we were, me who we were meant to be, to become our best selves. Malala's story so far is that lesson to us all, and she's an inspiration to girls everywhere. Her courage and strength are driven by the great capacity for the love within her. This gives her all the tools that she needs to make a difference in the world. Her father told us that he didn't clip her wings, and so she's risen like a glorious soaring bird rising from the sterile ashes of appalling tyranny. More powerful than ever, more compassionate than ever, and more committed than ever to speak out for the rights of women and girls in our world who are silenced through dogma, through terror. They tried to silence Malala. Instead, her voice and her message have been amplified for all the world to hear. They tried to instill fear, but instead her courage taught the world what it is to be truly brave. They tried to kill all hope, but instead her miraculous recovery showed the world that we must never despair, never give up hope. 
when I call Malala a hero, I realize that what makes a hero is not what they say and not what they symbolize, but how they change the way that we think and act. When I think of Malala, I think about what I can possibly do to make myself more like her. Each and every one of us here, I'm sure, <coughs> wished or prayed for her survival. Well now, we must all play a part in not just supporting Malala, but in saying no to tyranny. We must stand up and be counted. We must raise our voices. We must shout for all the world, what all the world to hear this word. Enough. Thank you. to hear Jo Pascal in conversation with this remarkable young woman, this hero of our times. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Malala. <laughs> 